Good morning. Last uh, Sunday we talked about transformed hearts uh, are reflected in people who run after Jesus with all their hearts. And today I want to share about building bigger people, recognising what Jesus is doing in us and among us. And this week you would have received, or most of you, if you're on email, would have received a letter uh, from me outlining uh, some of the changes that we're making to the leadership structure of the church here at Seton because we've recognised that God is building some pretty big people. And if you didn't actually receive uh, that letter, we do have a hard copy, a little bit extra detail that's in the entranceway and you can uh, get hold of that. But um, let me share with you the broad outlines of the changes we're making as to how our church will be led from now on. And it's really a recognition that Jesus has been doing some amazing things. And changing the climate of the church involves the development of new leaders and recognising existing leaders and seeing what what the Lord is doing among us. Um, Firstly, in relation to my role as uh, uh, lead pastor, it is being adapted in 2016 because of the demands of of my several uh, leadership responsibilities. Um, And we've been prayerfully reflecting over the past six months on these changes and we believe that that they are God's clear direction and that they are in the best interests of our seat and church. And so the little maxim that I've used over recent years that I need to do less of things so I can do more of other things, we're ratcheting that up a little bit more, in fact quite a bit. Uh, For those who don't know, let me just give you a little bit of what I do so you understand why I have to do less here at Seaton and have been, is uh, I've been leading the church now, um, this is my 38th year, hard to believe isn't it that I was only eight years of age when they appointed me. (laughs) Um, And we've also been, by the grace of God, been able to plant daughter churches and we attempted in the 1980s to do a few and we fell over and and it didn't work, but we learnt, learnt what not to do and we grew. But from 1990, with our Murray Bridge, was our first daughter church. We have a stack of daughter churches, Christian Family Centre churches, and since really 1990, my role has been to kind of be the senior minister, uh, overseer of our church plants, helping the lead pastors, their leadership teams. Um, just the transition of, of uh, Pastor David Smythe to Pastor David Bland in our Blackwood church you wouldn't realise, but the amount of work that involved in over two or three years and working, praying, interviewing, sharing, working with the teams. And that's not here at Seaton, that's in our our Blackwood Church. Um, We're having our Christian Family Centre Church together on the 24th and 25th of uh, this month and we're getting all of our leaders, probably about 70 leaders, we're bringing our Indigenous pastors and leaders in from Western Australia, Karen Cook, uh, at Warnham, through to Joseph Tapara, Reuben uh, Burton, Amata and Erna Bella and, and a couple of others and they're coming in and we're having a time with the pastors, the leadership teams, about 70 of us and at night there'll probably be 100, 150 or so um, of other key leaders that we're inviting in. So uh, that, that's significant in uh, so the Seton Church, Christian Family Centre Churches. Uh, I've been leading our denominational family, Christian CRC Church International, for the last 14 years and previous to that, that's in Australia, and then previous to that I was leading it here in South Australia for nearly a decade. And I visit every state and territory each year, and I worked out that I'd do six weeks of national executive meetings, full weeks with conferences. So in a few weeks' time I have about about 12 people, leaders from across our nation here for a week, where we just talk about and pray through the business and the leadership of our movement here in Australia and overseas. That's about six weeks. And then uh, I've been serving on our leaders of, uh, our heads of Christian churches committee here in South Australia. So the 12 denominations, Catholic, Anglican, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, CRC, etc. We meet once every two months. It's called LOXA, Leaders of Christian Churches. And for the last two years, I've been the chairman of it. And I've kind of resisted doing that because of my travel. But, um, and I said to them, you want a wild Pentecostal to chair the leaders of Christian churches? They said, yes, Bill, we do. So uh, I'm handing that on 
uh, actually from last Friday to the head of the Baptist uh, movement in South Australia, he'll be chairing it. But just to let you know, just in that area, like Monday night, this Monday night, I'm in St Peter's Cathedral helping oversee a celebration for the school's ministry group that's been operating for, in one form or another, for 35 years here in South Australia. So there'll be hundreds of people there. Then Thursday morning, we'll do the Parliamentary Christian Fellowship. So our members of Parliament will be at St Peter's again. Uh, we give them a book and pray for them. So again, they'll have duties there to do. Uh, Friday afternoon with a group of Australia-wide leaders, we're meeting with the Prime Minister for a couple of hours in Sydney to talk about important matters to do with moral, ethical issues that we, not political stuff, but really the moral, ethical stuff. So um, then in March, I go for two weeks in Papua New Guinea. Uh, visiting three locations. So you can see my program is pretty full and it's focusing on leadership, training, teaching and, um, and so therefore it's been, uh, I could not do this if we had not had in place a fantastic group of pastors and leaders to do the shepherding, caring, counselling and, and preaching, teaching ministries of the church. And it's not like, I mean, th there are pastoral matters that I have to deal with and do still deal with, and I love pastoring and counselling and caring, but I can't be the primary caregiver of every person in the church. It's impossible. I did uh, Ron Clements' funeral just a, a few weeks ago with Dorothy, and that was a joy to slip into, to pastor and help Dorothy and Ron and, and uh, in, Don, in him translating from, from this life to the next life. And so... You never stop doing that, but just the, the responsibilities have required that I've really had to do a lot less of things that I did perhaps uh, 10 years ago. So, so my role is being adapted. Secondly, we are creating two new leadership roles in the life of the church. And that centres around Pastor Tim Lockins and Pastor Cass Tompich, who I think we all recognise God has been doing something pretty amazing in them and through them over recent years. Tim has been our executive pastor for the last few years and he kind of deputises for me and, and, and really runs things here with the team when I'm away. Um, and so uh, we're now making that role executive pastor redundant and we're officially recognising Tim as the deputy lead pastor of the church and he'll take on a lot of leadership responsibilities not just when I'm away but even when I'm here. And so um, and, and Cass Tompich with her amazing gifts uh, when she became a Christian in, at 19 years of age, uh, in, I better not say how old you are, in the late 90s anyway, um, so Cass uh, came to Christ and uh, uh, around Easter, the next year she was involved in our creative ministries team and she's just developed as a pastor leader running a whole pile of ministries and her skills in being able to identify leaders and to develop them and, and unleash them has been amazing and she's uh, been involved in a whole pile of departments in the church so she's the ministry's development pastor working with Tim and uh, myself and we're going to form like a, a senior leadership group and uh, so I'm delegating a, a lot of my leadership roles to them to outwork and um, so we're just acknowledging and recognising what God has been doing through them and it has already blessed the church and Tim and Cass are also on our board of elders, which oversees Christian Family Centre churches. So we have Norm Reed from Hobart uh, and uh, Josh O'Callaghan, Mark Betcher and Ray Betcher was on our board of elders. It oversees all the churches from Alice Springs, the Indigenous communities, Hobart. And our responsibility is the big picture, not actually running the churches. So they've been on that team for a few years and have been growing tremendously. And from today, when we have our commissioning time, Tim will be, will be greatly expanding his leadership role in our church. Even when I'm when I'm in town. So one of the dilemmas has been is, you know, I'm out of town and they run things and what decisions can they make and what they can't make. We've defined all that and what we're saying is just make decisions, lead. And I trust them implicitly. And some of the big picture stuff, yes, I'll be involved and in my role as lead pastor and wherever I am around the world, we hope to have a Skype time once a week. Um, so uh, this is really important. So he will be assisted by Cass and uh, he will be leading and chairing most of the key team meetings. And if anything was to happen to me, um, Tim is ready to become lead pastor subject to the Board of Elders decision. And, um, and I think we've all been able to see that over the recent years, how his development in preaching and leading and, and, and building of teams has been fantastic. And so, um, so we're officially recognising that. And, and folks, it's an important step in our long-term succession planning. I just turned 62 a few weeks ago. I can't believe it. it. It just seemed like yesterday I was here 24 years of age and now I'm 62. 
And those of us in my age group know what I'm talking about. It goes really quick. So we have to make sure that we have in place proper succession and, uh, and ensure that the church will go on to the next generation and achieve even greater things. And that's, that's, going to, that's the delight of my heart is to see our new leaders really developing. So thirdly, so my roles are being changed. Uh, Tim and Cass's role is being upgraded. So they're becoming a leadership group, a small leadership group, and they'll be directly reporting to me but I won't have any other direct reports. And so we are creating a team, what we call the ministry's director's team, a group of 12. And I rejoice, really rejoice, in how God has spiritually developed each of these members. And I'll mention their names and I'll put them in, of course, the letter that you received this week. Um, They're fantastic. And we've seen them growing in their ministry fruitfulness and influence in the life of the church. Outside of Milan Tompich, who's my age, no, he's older than me actually, six months, Janet Bryce, who's in her 50s, you don't mind me saying that, Janet, do you? Early 50s, let's just say early, very young. The rest of them are in their 20s and 30s. It's, it, and that's just, what are you got to be sorry about? It's the truth, yeah, yeah, she is. Yeah. It's only Greek women that when they, my mum when she turns 60, the next year I said, how old are you, mum? She goes, 59. The next year after that, 58. <laughs> Greek women go backwards. Isn't that right? The Greek girls? Anyway. Um, so it's just wonderful to see that the transition that's taking place, that God has been raising up magnificent leaders within the church, effective pastors and leaders, and, and we're thrilled with that. And so they are actually leaders of leaders and are being commissioned today, along with Cass and Tim, to build big-hearted big compassion, full of compassion, the love of Christ, and big capacity ministry teams in their areas of ministry responsibility. And I trust them totally, and I commend them to you. For example, Pastor Sam Chesser um, and his wife Tanya, they can't be here today because Sam has his grandma's funeral in, in the Mount Gambia, but Sam is employed two days a week overseeing youth. That's about 100 and charge and raw, maybe altogether 120, maybe more, I don't know. I don't know a lot of things in the life of the church. And, um, and then he it works three days a week as a school teacher. And he will have Emily Bland and Timothy Hersey, who are university students in their early 20s, one day a week employed. So he is already a leader of leaders. So he is actually leading. So even the appointments of those uh, leaders, I really wasn't involved in that because they know their competency. So Sam could see and Tim could see. And so to me, I just say, well, if, if, if you know, Pray, reflect, fine, that's great. So already that delegation has been occurring where some of those decisions are not my decisions. But um, they're overseeing junior and senior teens. And we reckon, uh, we've also got um, uh, a couple of interns, uh, Holly Martin and Nick Sanford are starting, eh? And they're, they're in their late teens and they're doing their, batch, their diploma in youth, is it? what is it? Diploma in... I don't know what it is. It's a diploma anyway in youth uh, ministry and they're going to be interns here working under Sam. So already you can see that here is a leader of leaders and that youth ministry of 120 so could easily become 250 in 12 months or, or, or 15 months. So you see they're leaders of leaders and we're what, recognising and delegating authority to them to say guys lead those ministries and grow them to the full uh, which, is, which is really uh, thrilling. And we're going to pray over them, we're going to anoint them with oil, we're going to lay hands on them as we commission them in Jesus' name at the end of my message. Now, a question that's raised to me from time to time, and actually one that I raise to myself is, how does this happen? <laughs> and who actually makes these appointments in the Christian Family Centre? And you may have come from another church tradition, and they might have organisational structures, and like uh, committees and particular people that do the appointing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm all for accountability and I'm all for excellent governance. We have an excellent board of elders governing and laying the, the, the railway tracks, you know, five foot, foot six, not 3.6. And, and we work within those parameters, within the law and within proprietary and financial accountability and, and uh, excellent ethics and morality operating. So they do that, we need that. But really, um, how is it done? 
In some respects, I don't know how it occurs. In some respects, when the person says, well, who actually makes these appointments? You know what I come back to? Actually, I say, well, actually, it's Jesus. Oh, come on, but you're, you're the lead pastor and, and you've got a team and, and you make appointments. Don't you take a vote and have 10 people say, who should... No, we don't take votes. We don't have, well, I think this person should be in that role. We actually really believe that Jesus leads his church and that he, he's not dead, he's actually alive, he's just in heaven, but he sent the Holy Spirit and he's given us his word that he actually leads and guides the whole process. Let me answer that question of how does this take place and who actually makes these appointments by reading a few scriptures, which I think will be helpful before we pray for these guys. Matthew 16, this is a classic story. Classic scripture, famous scripture. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, hey boys, who do people say the Son of Man is? He's testing them. And of course, they're dumb. They must have picked up some Eastern philosophy. He said, oh, maybe you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Maybe you're Elijah come back from the dead. Maybe you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so you can see Jesus, okay, you guys know nothing of what's actually taking place. You don't realise that God is walking among you. The eternal son in the person of Jesus of Matthew and you don't even understand it. So so he says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And of course, Mr Foot and Mouth Disease, for the first time in his life, says the right thing. But Jesus says, it wasn't from your own head, boy, My father in heaven has told you this. And so Peter blurts it out and he gets it right. He goes, you're the Messiah. You're God in human form. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And he said, and I tell you that you're Peter. In the Greek, that's a word petros, which means a little, like a... Uh, a little a flake of a rock, just a little little rock. And, and then but he goes, Peter, you, you, you're a little rock. But on this rock, this Petra, this big foundation, what foundation? The revelation you've got from the Father that God is visiting the planet, that I am the son of the living God, alive, God in human form. Said, Upon this I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. <laughs> Jesus said that. So, look, I love my Catholic brothers I have a good relationship with the Archbishop here in Adelaide. He's a friend. He's, you know, we, we, I've been to his home and, and that, and, and they're, they're beautiful Christian people. But we divert on that one. We don't think the church is built around Peter. We think the church is built around Jesus Christ and he uses Peter and Paul and you and me and all of us. So he's not saying, oh, Peter, you're going to be the head of the church. No, no, no. He's saying, Peter, you're, 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 you're a little Petros. But upon the revelation that you've received from my father, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. What a great statement. And he says, and I will give you, Peter, and you, Paul, and you, Michael, and, 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 and you, Nathan, and all of you, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Folks, Jesus has never stopped building his church. And he does it through the people he calls authorizes and empowers nothing can stop his church advancing no devil no schemes of men Jesus is the living head of his church and he builds it and he grows it the decisions we're making today are the decisions that Jesus has led us in and I'll explain how that takes place let me tell you what Paul says about this in Ephesians 1 he says the great apostle says and God placed all things under his feet Jesus and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church now he he, so he believes Jesus is alive he's not a dead savior he's a living lord he rose from the dead which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way so even his body is to be filled by Jesus our purpose in being is to let Jesus rule and reign in our hearts and lives and to preside among us. The purpose of the church is to worship Jesus, is to spread the message of Jesus, to connect people to Jesus and to let him be the Lord and master of their lives and through that community to influence and, and, and impregnate the community and world that we live in to bring light and life to our lost world. And so here he says he is the head over everything for the church. 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so Jesus is the living head of his church. And no man or committee can take his place. And so some church organisations give me the impression like, well, you know, we've got to make some decisions. We've got to provide leadership because, you know, like Jesus is not here. It's a headless body and it's like a body without a head trying to, trying to where's it supposed to go? Or we better put a committee there. Or we better get, call a senior minister that he be the head. Or a board of elders that they be the head. Or a, uh, a national executive that they be the head. Or a pope or a college of cardinals, whatever system. It's easy for people to replace Jesus and think that somehow he's not doing anything. And then we have to do it. He is the living head. The living head. And he communicates his will through his Holy Spirit who he's poured out upon his people and by his guiding words through the Holy Scriptures. We have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures where Jesus speaks and leads through them today. Have a look at Ephesians 4, again the Apostle Paul. He says, but to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and you can check out Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and he lists about 16 gifts, administrators, organisers, servers, healers, miracle workers, a whole pile of, of, of ministry gifts and functions. He says, and Christ has a portion, notice this, he has given each of us grace, so Christ himself gives why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So these leadership appointments today, Tim, Cass, these ministry directors, they're not there to do all the work of ministry. Their chief task is to equip you. They're going to be leaders of leaders so that those leaders can help you so that we can all function as the body of Christ and be a healthily growing body and to be really effective and, and to ensure that his church will grow healthily. He calls us and graces us to be equippers and empowerers so that every member of Jesus' body will function. We are all ministers in the church and we are all missionaries in the world and Jesus calls leaders to help us outwork this call that's upon all of us as Christ followers. You are a minister. You are called to be a minister in the church, functioning in how he's wired you and gifted you. He's called you to be a missionary in your world. As Chris Kipitogli shared last week, he's a missionary there at Mitcham in Frameland. By the way, he makes a living selling frames, picture frames. But he sees himself as a witness. Boy, that was revelatory. And Chris made another interesting comment. He said, you know, in the early days, I used to try and make people come to Christ. And he said, I gave up and said, Jesus, you bring the people. That reveals that Jesus is the living head of his church and he is the one that empowers ministry. And these people come and Chris is just open for business. So we need to be open for business and let Jesus speak through us as we share his good news. That he's God, that he loves people, that he died on a cross to remove the sin barrier, to restore them to God, that he sends the Holy Spirit because he rose from the dead to inhabit us and he gives us gifts to operate his ministry and his life here and now. That's pretty exciting stuff. In 1 Peter 4.10, the Apostle Peter says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, not to serve yourself. Tim, Cass, Adrian, Nick, all these leaders, one of the chief reasons why they're leaders is they don't serve themselves. They see themselves as equippers to serve others, to serve the body. I want no one in leadership roles in the Christian family center who's self-serving, who's self-centered, who thinks it's all about them. It's actually all about you and all about lost souls out there that need to come to Christ. And our heart is to see, and we really believe that God wants this church to double in its size. Why? To be an extra big, big, we're really a big church now. It's not, bigness is not the issue. It's the salvation of lost men and women and teenagers and children out there who are going to a Christless eternity unless they come to Jesus Christ and meet him as their saviour. And we have that responsibility to share the message. So each of you, 1 Peter 4.10 says, should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. My task as 
the senior minister, and that of our overseeing teams of the church is to watch what Jesus is doing and how he is doing it through people. I'm forever looking, forever looking, watching, looking for Jesus. I see him in him. I see his gift working through that person. I see the evidence of, wow, I see fantastic gift. And in the early days, these two churches we planted that fell over in the 80s, they were fantastic gifts. But I looked for the gift, I didn't look for the fruit. And one of the men was just an abusive man towards his wife and kids. He wasn't a very nice guy. But I wasn't looking at Carrie, oh, gifts, gifts, he's leading people to Christ. Well, he fell over, destroyed himself. And, and we learned some lessons. So you've got to look for fruit and gifts. And so you, you look for good character. How do they handle their... How do they... Are they obedient to their parents, you kids here? Are they obedient to their parents? Are they good students at school? Or do they fight with their teachers? Are they getting high distinctions for everything? <laughs> no pressure. Hey, character has to do with how I conduct myself at home, at school, at university, with my neighbours, with my friends. And, and so character, fruitfulness, Christ-likeness is as important as giftedness and competency. So, but we look for those things, we observe, we really look. That's my task, to be constantly looking. And, and we are constantly assessing and discerning and evaluating what Jesus is doing through people and then we recognise them. You understand? Then, now take the six C's off, guys. That's too early. Jumping the gun. It's my punchline. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Anyway. <laughs> then we recognise them. See, I can have somebody come to me and he's done a PhD in theology and another PhD in ministry and he might have 10 talents, like really gifted. But if he doesn't look after his wife and kids and he's naughty in, in his behaviours, he won't get the first base at the Christian Family Centre. And I've actually had that. I've actually tapped people on the shoulder and said, there's no ministry place for you here. I mean, with one man, very gifted. And I suspected he was clocking his wife. Suspected, just felt as I went to her and I said, is he? Pretty bold in those days, my Greekness, I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit, I just said, is he doing something wrong to you? Like, and she wouldn't answer me. I said, is he hitting you? Because he had an anger problem, but very gifted. And she wouldn't answer. Well, he used to belt her up and finally she got rid of him and, uh, but he, remember, he wrote hate letters to me saying, I have ruined the opportunity soon to become a pastor. I've done all this study. And you know what? It was water off a duck's back. I said, no way, Jose. This little black duck ain't going to recognize somebody who doesn't have fruit, even though he's gifted. You understand? It's got to be both. That's why these guys here are beautiful people in both fruitfulness and giftedness. And some of them, we've been observing them from when they were little kids and we can see the consistency of their lives and we see how credible they've become because they're so consistent. And those who are credible, you can have confidence in and trust them and I trust them. We examine carefully the fruit and gifts that we are clearly evident. We are character and competency fruit inspectors. And Paul shares this balance between gifts and fruit so perfectly in 1 Corinthians because the Corinthians, these, these Greeks in Corinth, are wild boys and girls. I mean, some of them are into fruit, saying it's all about fruit. Others say, forget the fruit, it's all about gifts. I mean, there was lots of sin in the church and Paul had to kick a guy out and then, and then he repented and they didn't want to re bring him back. They were confused. And so some of them are into fruit, 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 perfection. No gifts. Others just gifts, 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 forget about the fruit of the person. And the Apostle Paul says it beautifully in this kind of hinge verse between chapters 12, 13 and 14. In, in, in chapter 14, verse 1, he says to them, he encourages them, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Isn't that good? Well said. And today, we are commissioning Tim and Cass and our 12 ministry directors, except that, that uh, Sam and Tanny can't be here with us, 
I call them the six C leaders. Now you can put my punchline up. (laughs) They are leaders who are called by Jesus and they have good character, fruit of the Spirit and growing leadership and ministry competency, gifts of the Spirit. They have, they are fully committed to Jesus Christ, dedicated, committed, and they have the CFC culture in relation to our vision, our values, our ministry approach. We've been going for 40 years. We've never really changed our our vision and values. We've changed everything else. But the changeless stuff is the core, what we believe, our beliefs, our values, our ministry approach. We'll change everything else to be more relevant, to be more culturally kind of attuned to our world, to be able to win men and women. I mean, there was one day when we all used to come to church in, in suits and ties, even when it was 150 degrees. Look at you. Is there one decent man here with a tie? Yes, I see him. Put your hands together for that man. He inspires me. And of course, Martin Septo. He is the good looker. I mean, when he's on the platform, don't you say, I want to dress like Martin, fellas. I want to become African. <laughs> oh, it's good that we can laugh. But we change. We change. We change. We adapt. And, uh, and so the culture in relation to our to our vision and values and ministry approaches and they are in loving relationship with one another and therefore the chemistry between them is all terrific. And so it'd be awful to put a team together and they don't like each other. They just fight with one another. They don't fight. They're strong, they're opinionated, they've got good opinions, they're not yes people, but they like each other. I had them for breakfast the other Saturday morning and Kathy did one of her Vasilaka specials. I couldn't kick them out the house, they just wanted to stay there. I said, I want to watch some sport, thanks. Out you go, come on. I just like to meet together, share together, be together. That's a really good sign that our pastors, our leaders like each other and work together well and prefer one another in love. And there's lots of grace that operates there. So I would now like to call to the front our uh, senior leadership team, Pastor Tim and Pastor Cass, you guys like to come forward and... um, and uh, you can actually have your spouse with you, Michael, because, Michael, come and stand with your pastor wife. In my interviews with Cass and Mike, let me tell you something. She is his boss at church. <laughs> and at the home, man, this guy's king. Oh. <laughs> the Greek way, he is the head of his home. Oh, I like that. Isn't that right, Michael? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just teasing them. And, um, and so um, it's wonderful. And Nikki, if you'd like to come too and stand with your husband, with my grandson. And if my wife would like to come forward too. And, um, and uh, we're going to... So you guys just come close together. And now I'm going to ask the, the ministry directors and their partners to actually come and stand here as well. Because we want to pray for you. I'd like to come and stand here for those that are married, that is. There's some who are single. So uh, come and stand here as I introduce you. And uh, this is fantastic. Here, just come, just line up a little bit. Yeah, stand with your spouses if you like. That's good. It's fantastic. And uh, you come down a little bit further, guys, here. Make a bit of room. So let me introduce to you Down the end here is Shay Drew. Watch this space with this girl. She's been working under Cass for the last, how long? One year. And we employed her a day a week in the kids' ministry. We're now employing her two days a week. She's at university, finishing school. She is a dynamo with children. And the other thing is, she's 20 years of age. And the parents love her. And she has credibility because she's consistent. And and she's very, very gifted but also excellent character. We reckon the kids' ministry of 120, 30 could jump up to 200, 300. And and we reckon that there'll be, she'll be, she's a leader of leaders. She'll develop a team of people. I could see her full time and there'd be two or three other staff, one, two, three days a week functioning. And that whole division 
will be making their own decisions and, and flowing within the broad parameters of the church. So we want you to fly, Shay. Yeah. Let fly like an eagle. Yeah. Cassie Pidd, who's just returned from overseas, and uh, you know she's got the travel travel bug big time, and she's been my PA, and uh, and she is like our executive assistant. She's at all the meetings, taking minutes and out working some of the decisions. She's a brilliant administrator, organiser. She organises my life. I couldn't do what I did if I didn't have somebody doing all that stuff for me in the administration. So Cassie, you're, you're a little genius and we appreciate you so much. Uh, Stacey and Lockie Donaldson, uh, they run our young adults ministry. They are full-time with unbelievably responsible jobs. He builds our, our, new, our submarines for Australia. So those big war machines, he builds them. And he won't tell me a thing about what he does. It's all top secret. I can't get a word out of him. And I helped him get the job, didn't I? I gave you a contact and that's how you repay me. Okay, no information. Engineer, brilliant man. His wife runs state treasury. She handles the budgets for our South Australia. Slight exaggeration. But she does, she does handle... Uh, uh, has been over a billion dollars in administering major departments of state. Uh, four million. Billion. Four billion. You, so she oversees four billion. Do you think she might be okay to be a... F hey, to do the accounts of the church is way below her competency. So, but she is brilliant and, uh, in, in her, her fields and excels in the public service. They run the young adults ministry. Again, watch this space. Uh, that could, and they're doing it double time and they're developing a fabulous group of leaders. So we recognise Lockie and Stacey and are proud to have them on our, uh, as ministry directors, same as with Shay. Janet and Philip Bryce, well, they are legends. They have been foundation members of the church. Philip, the first convert uh, of the church. Janet was my PA before Cassie came on and then she was elevated to become a pastor. So Cassie, that may be the route for you too. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I better be careful what I say. I'll be in trouble tomorrow. But uh, Janet oversees our care ministry and connections ministries in the church. And, uh, and an experienced pastor, Philip is a double-time pastor, does an enormous amount of pastoral ministry, but he works full-time in the school ministry group, which is fantastic. My wife, Kathy, I've asked her to come and stand with, uh, with us to pray, as uh, she is like a mother in the church and has been involved in so many activities, but has never sought position in any way, just wants to serve and humbly serves. And so... Uh, um, uh, I could not do what I do without her support and, uh, and the support that she gives to our kids and our grandkids. And then we have the magnificent Adrian and the beautiful Danielle. She's the best thing he's got going for him, by the way. <laughs> he has scored way beyond the grade. <laughs> but both are school teachers and both are ministry gifts. Adrian's been recently credentialed, so has uh, Lockie. And we see that the others here will also be starting on the credentialing process. We see them as ministry gifts. Uh, Adrian is a brilliant teacher, preacher. Uh, with David Bland going to Blackwood, he will be developing as one of our Sunday morning preachers. He's already done some. He does a lot Sunday nights. He runs Bible Discovery. And, and his giftings and abilities to communicate are fantastic. I get so much from him. His research. He's done his... his uh, uh, theology degrees and education degrees and uh, brilliant guy and with his support with, and Danielle is actually a brilliant preacher as well the message she did on Jonah on Sunday night you ought to download it from uh, what is it YouTube yeah it's great I learned something about the whale so um, uh, so we, we are so thankful that Adrian can be one of our ministry directors Cass I've talked about Tim I've talked about um, I'm so pleased um, in their, 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 their roles and how they've developed in the life of the church. Uh, Nikki, his wife, is overseeing the communities aspect of our, uh, of our church, reaching into the communities, the ministries that we have, the interface with the communities. And that we, Nikki's got a heart to somehow bring those people and those ministries and people into the life of the church, to come to Christ and to, and to, fi and to find him as saviour and to get connected in, into the life of the church. And as you know, Nikki's a very busy person uh, with uh, three kids. She's a world-class violinist. She's in demand um, in her career of music. And at like 8.30, she played here. 
the 8.30 service with Laura, just a guitar and a violin, and it made me weep. So you should come to the 8.30 service too. No, no, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> so Nikki, um, as a great support to Tim, but also in her own right, she's here as a ministry leader, and, uh, and I'm thrilled uh, with them both. Hey, look, let me also say that because Tim's my son-in-law and Nick's my daughter, it has been harder for them in their development in the life of the church. And I've actually made it harder for them. And I told them that from the beginning, where lines are never going to be crossed from the personal to the professional. And, uh, and, and, and Tim has actually uh, earned his spurs because Jesus has actually called him. Initially, Tim and Nick thought they'd be here for two or three years and then perhaps go and plant a church. God is calling them to put their roots here for varying reasons, but it's not easy. And I've made it tough, and it is tough, uh, to be related and also to be the deputy lead pastor. But he has got the recognition from our board and from our team because of Jesus' calling and gifting and his capacity and how he conducts himself. And so and I think that's important to stay that. Uh, for the, some of you that might look in and say, well, is this a family show? No, it ain't. It would be much easier for Tim and Nick to actually have gone elsewhere because I've made it tough for them. It's much, e much, much easier for Cass and Adrian and others than for them. And they've excelled and Tim is going to be uh, a brilliant in, in the deputy leader role. And anything happens to me, he could fill in, fill, immediately come into that role. So it's great. Nathan Betcher, he pitched his tent here and lives on property. Um, <laughs> many years ago. Uh, Nathan is like a son and he's uh, been in the life of the church from when he was a little boy and as one of our pastors he just is like, he's multi-gifted from leading worship to preaching to behind the scenes. He's employed by our CRC movement two days a week in overseeing our training, those seminars, plus he's a day a week in the life of the church here. In, in, he's actually chairs our teaching team, the, the preachers, so he gets us all together, we get the themes together and also in communications, and, and he is just a wonderful man of God, brilliant. Uh, Milan Tompich and his wife Aileen have been with me since 1979, when Milan came into the church in uh, West Beach days, and uh, Pastor Bill Osborne and Norma had a lot to do with them and when they first came in. It took Milan about a year to get saved, he was really hard, and, um, but he got saved and been serving ever since, been on our board for 25 years, Board of Elders, and he's now been, as a businessman, finished up business and he oversees operations, finance, facilities and he does a brilliant job. He's hard on himself and we're, but he, we, we love and esteem him and his maturity, like I think of, you know, you look at Phil, Janet and Milan and myself, we're the older ones and uh, we, we actually, Milan's there like with Janet to give strength and mature, wisdom to those that are younger and they can call upon them. So these are fantastic leaders.